This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Thank you for inviting me. And um, first of all, I want to say something about the Vonicama cells, or VENs, uh, is that they are not uniquely human. Um, they are uh, characteristic features of frontal insular cortex and anterior cingulate cortex in mammals with brains typically 400 grams or larger. They're characteristic then of, of ape and human brains, and they're also, we find them in elephants, and we find them in whales, um, and we suspect that there is a common uh, uh, related uh, type of cell probably present in all mammals in anterior insular cortex. Uh, and it's an interesting story about trying to understand how those specializations come about. Anyway, um, I'm going to focus on the frontal insular cortex, which is this red wedge of tissue here, which lies between the insula here and the orbital frontal cortex here. And the insular cortex in mammals represents sensory inputs of taste and visceral and motor control mastication, swallowing in food consumption and in digestion. And the insular cortex in primates, especially in humans, receives the differentiated somatic inputs relayed up from the spinal cord that have to do with warmth, coolness, and sensual touch, which mediate interpersonal contact. Now, von Economo was, was actually one of many of the, of the early neuroanatomists to describe uh, these cells. Uh, they were described by Cajal and by Betts and others earlier, but von Economo did the best job. And uh, so we decided to, to uh, uh, assign that name. The name that von Economo himself used for them were the rod and the corkscrew shells based on, on their respective shapes. And here are some uh, Bielschowski stains showing the axons for the, uh, uh, the, the Venns with its very characteristic uh, morphology. Um, and this is a work that uh, uh, Carly Watson and I did uh, on Golgi reconstructions. And this is a typical, or actually rather large, uh, 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 layer five pyramidal cell and, and, and a nearby ven. And you can see that, that the, the vens essentially have uh, a very much simpler dendritic uh, 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 layout with a cell body located here at a single apical dendrite and a, and a, a, a relatively unbranched basal dendrite. And that's the hallmark for the vens. And that we presume that, that the vens are, are specializations of, of, of pyramidal cells and that somewhere in the developmental program for vens is a suppression of this branching. And indeed, we have some, even some clues as to what the, the genetic basis of that might be. Uh, possibly in the form of, of the, the gene DISC-1. Now, this is a very laborious slide to prepare. I, I actually sat down and plotted each ven within the section for a chimpanzee, a gorilla, and a human, so in a slice through FI, uh, to give you a sense of where they're located. They're particularly located in this very characteristic juncture here uh, in, this, in this spot here. And you'll see this will come up over and over again, this, this spot, because it's a real, uh, hot spot in imaging studies, in, in studies that involve things like uh, 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 sustaining a loss uh, in a gambling task, or in food-related activities, or in disgust, or in, in a variety of social activities that I'll describe later on. Now, the vents have this very interesting feature that, that their distribution is skewed toward the right hemisphere. So, 
uh, Bill Hopkins talked about left hemisphere specializations. Well, this is definitely a right hemisphere specialization. So if they're the same number, if they were the same number, they would fall between the right and left hemispheres. They would fall along this line. So we're talking here about the ratio between the, the left and, and uh, the right and the left, so that, that in newborn humans, they're about the same number in a relatively small number uh, in uh, FI, and then in all postnatal cases uh, in both humans and in, and, in, and in the apes, we find more in the uh, right side than the left, typically 30 to 40 percent more. And this is probably part of a larger system that is also rightward skewed. Uh, that's the unseant fasciculus. Note this, this large fiber bundle, which is located very close to the location of FI, and probably, uh, con uh, in fact, contains some of the fibers we think uh, that uh, may be coming and being emitted by the vents, which we know are projection neurons. Um, and we're testing that right now. But th this system of the unseant fasciculus. Uh, is shown here in comparisons both in, in uh, this is the volume of the encephasiculus being greater on the right side in both controls and schizophrenics, uh, and then in the number of axons within the encephasiculus. So this is typically about 29% more on the right side by volume, and maybe 33, 34% more uh, on the right side with respect to fiber number, and that's very close to what we're seeing for the, for the uh, skewing for the vents. Now, recently I've begun to be, uh, be involved in studies of, of centenarian brains. And this is the brain of a 104-year-old lady uh, uh, and who is not demented. Uh, and, and because we have access to a, a, a very well-documented population of, 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 of elderly uh, individuals uh, studied by David Bennett and his colleagues at Rush University in Chicago, who has uh, on the order of 2,500 subjects in his population, all of whom will go to autopsy, uh, we can have very well documented cases where the histopathology is well understood. Many other aspects of genetics and the morphology are known for these, and the clinical picture, we can, we can show that they're not demented. Uh, so we've begun to study this. I plotted the first few that we studied. It's quite laborious to do these counts, but this is, um, this is across the span of life. So this up to 35 weeks post-conception, there are no vents in FI. Uh, at birth, there are relatively small numbers. This is a, a very late-term infant, uh, uh, three, to four, three weeks post-term, uh, 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 suggesting the number of vents is increasing at about that time. Uh, and these are infants. We have this one extreme outlier here. But typically, uh, from infancy on through uh, uh, into middle age, late middle age, we're typically having about 100,000 vents um, in the right FI. And then we consider our centenarians. And th I was just astounded by this. This is the data point for the brain that I just showed you, S say two to five times as many vents. Uh, and I don't know what to make of that, but it does appear that there, that there are more. And we have about an additional 20 cases that we can do, so we can really nail this down, whether this is in fact the case. But one of the interesting hypotheses that we have about the frontal insular cortex is that it is a master homeostatic regulator, and so you might expect that, that superior homeostatic regulation might be related to longevity. Um, this is a, a work showing uh, that when people sustain a gambling loss, uh, that they get what in the jargon of the, of the behavioral economist, a risk prediction error. And that is powerfully uh, activates this part of the insulin. In fact, this is right where the vents are particularly concentrated in FI. So gambling loss is, is, activates this structure very well. Now, another thing that, that activates, and we think of this as, as Basically, economics is about foraging. Economics is about foraging choices in which you make the appropriate choices to get what you need to survive nutritionally. And we think that there's evidence that frontal insular cortex is something like an hedonic reward map and that that, that evolved under conditions of making foraging choices. Uh, and so another way of putting it is that it's a higher order chemosensory cortex, both taste and smell. So in this work by Dana Small, again, we have uh, activation by flavored stimuli here in this same locality, uh, this then-rich region of FI. And interestingly, when 
uh, they presented discordant flavors, uh, unusual, unappetizing flavors that activated this extreme lateral region. And uh, when they produced more co coherent, more uh, aesthetically pleasing flavors, it was a little bit more medial uh, to that, suggesting that there may be something like a flavor topic map or a donic map within this structure. Now, if you do the same thing with disgusting odors, that also activates the same lo locality. Um, and one of the things that we're working on now, because there's a beautiful uh, mapping of ol olfactory uh, stimuli that we can relate to psychophysics, we're, we're testing a hypothesis that uh, there would be a, 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 a odor flavor map within this, uh, this structure. Now, related to this, and now we're looking at the mouse, uh, this is anterior insula in the mouse, and these little spots here are in situ hybridizations of a class of cells located here, uh, which are, 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 are expressing neuromedin B. NMB is a gut uh, a, a gene that makes gut peptides that are crucial for, for peristalsis and for, for the regulation of gastric uh, uh, enzyme release. It's very specific. So what's it doing up here? Well, it seems to also be involved in the central nervous system in the regulation of appetite, which is consistent with this. Now, um, it turns out the neuromedin B is, is, is beautifully expressed on the vens, and rather selectively on the vens, and also expressed on a related population of cells called the fork neurons uh, that are, are, are located uh, and specialized features of this, of this area. Now, if you present uh, 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 a, a disgusting ta taste, or if a subject sees a disgusting food, or if they just imagine tasting a disgusting food, you get activity in the same locality in FI. Uh, now here, if you uh, present unpleasant taste to someone, they wrinkle up their nose in, in this characteristic disgust uh, facial expression, as opposed to tasting something pleasant. Uh, and that results in a, uh, a movements of the nose that you, uh, of this tissue here, these muscles, that you can re record electromyographically. And so you get uh, uh, this, this uh, activity here associated with the unpleasant. Uh, you also get this, however, in the ultimatum game when people are presented with what they perceive as unfair distributions, so resentment. So resentment reduces, produces the same facial expressions and that you can record electromyographically, and it also produces the same activity in the insula, the same location within the insula associated with social disgust, with having received an unfair distribution. Important politically. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, more broadly speaking, Kurth and his colleagues did a meta-analysis of 1,768 experiments involving almost 12,000 subjects in which the, the, the social experiments are coded in blue here, and it's clearly strongly localized in area FI. So that's very powerful evidence that FI is involved in social uh, uh, behavior. Now, area FI is also is particularly involved in social emotions that are related to social error. And those involve disgust, resentment, embarrassment, deception, guilt, empathy, and humor. And these uh, emotions often motivate corrective behaviors, and these corrective behaviors may be defective in autistic individuals. And we know that this area is, has reduced activities quite significantly and selectively in autistic individuals. Now, Carly Watson and I did an experiment where we worked with humor and we took 100 cartoons from the far side in the New Yorker, and we rated them in the scanner. Uh, and the activity of the left FI is associated param uh, with the, the degree of funniness of the cartoon, suggesting uh, registration of social error uh, specific to the structure. Now, broadly speaking then, we think that this system is basically originated for the regulation of food intake and consumption versus rejection. So overall, if we, if we look to the top here, uh, that we have the, the paradigm 
contrast between lust, consumption, and disgust, rejection. So the pro-social to anti-social poles. But that generalizes to a number of other uh, poles, such as love and hate, gratitude, resentment, self-confidence, embarrassment, trust, distrust, empathy, contempt, approval, disdain, pride, humiliation, truthfulness, deception, and atonement of guilt, many of which we think are things that are certainly characteristic of humans. Now, if you, uh, the imaging studies show the specific activation of FI for the underscored regions, uh, underscored in social emotions, and I suspect if somebody did the other ones, you'd find them as well. Now, recently, Peter Williamson and I wrote a book about these things called The Human Illnesses, uh, with which we summarized the re relationship of some of this to neuropsychiatric neuro disorders. But I'm going to talk about one particular one now, which is frontal temporal dementia. And this arose from a collaboration that I developed uh, quite a number of years ago with Bill Seeley, who uh, is a neurologist at the University of California, San Francisco, who is a specialist in frontal temporal dementia and who recently won a, M a MacArthur Award for his work in this area. And so frontal temporal dementia, uh, or FTD, is, associ is associated with a loss of emotional intimacy, first noted by, the, by one's spouse, uh, by a loss of empathy, by a loss of embarrassment, a loss of insight, a loss of the normal sense of humor, they develop very bizarre senses of humor, a loss of self-awareness, loss of theory of mind, a loss of social graces, a loss of the sense of the future, they live in the present, a loss of capacity for parenting. One of, one of Bill's patients, he asked the daughter of his patient at Christmas time, what do you want for Christmas? And he, the little girl said, to not have daddy home, <laughs> which is an ultimate tragedy, I think. A loss of impulse control, a loss of control of food intake, so that they typically gain weight, uh, is consistent with the general idea that this structure is involved in, in appetite regulation, and, and they lo lose control of swallowing, and that kills them. So Bill did this meta-analysis showing that FI and anterior cingulate, the vein-containing areas, uh, are, have been highlighted in many functional imaging studies of frontal temporal dementia. And so what we did then is we, we, um, we compared normal individuals, individuals with Alzheimer's disease in which the vents look actually look pretty normal. They're, they're, they're well spared, we think. And then in frontal temporal dementia, the vents become severely dysmorphic or actually die. The, uh, actually, this occurs by at least two different mechanisms. So this Pick's disease variant of frontal temporal dementia is a disorder of tau, uh, and F FTLD is associated with another uh, entirely separate mechanism. Nevertheless, they produce a similar phenotype, which involves the destruction of the vents. So if you, this is the, the, what we obtained from uh, layer five at, in normals, uh, very similar in uh, numbers in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so we have a, a, a dementia control. Uh, and then in frontal temporal dementia, about a three quarters reduction in the population of vents. And the, many of the ones that are survived are severely dysmorphic. And we can see uh, there are certain situations in which patients with frontal temporal dementia die at, at early ages. And we can see the Venn loss at, uh, at, at the earliest observable stages of the, of the disease. And then thank, I want to thank the many folks that have helped me uh, on this, and also particularly the funding with the McDonald Foundation has been wonderful, and Simons and National Institutes of Mental Health, and cast of thousands. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.